channel for your listening pleasure. Here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose, and welcome to episode number 281 of This Old Marketing, recorded on Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. And with me, as always, my friend, my colleague, and the only guy, I think, who didn't make a joke about the shape of Jeff Bezos' spaceship, Mr. Joe Polizzi. It's so funny you bring that up because we actually had dinner conversation yesterday with the family about that. It was it was brought Did you up really? because there were so many people talking about what is you know what's with billionaires compensating for something with the shape of their vessels. I mean, come on, it's just <laughs> it's just yeah. ridiculous. And well, and then all it the was, all uh, the talk about you know how how do you how much money do you have to have to to go to space? Did you see the twenty eight? Was it twenty eight million for the one yeah. that, that bid on That's it? That's right. Yeah, and then didn't show up. Is, oh, I didn't hear that. Just yeah, there was one guy who actually uh, who had bought a ticket um, with uh, on the on the Blue Origin flight, and then due to scheduling conflicts, couldn't make it. Can can you imagine? Right, it's like you spend whatever it is twenty five, twenty eight million dollars getting yourself a ticket on the space flight, and then go, ah, oh, damn, I forgot I had that lunch. You know I, what? Yeah, just I, you just know, put that into some perspective. Would you would you basically yeah. say, oh, you know, like you know, like it happens to let's say you've got tickets to a, a ball game. It's like oh, I, I spent yeah, sixty dollars. Exactly. I can't I can't find anybody to take it. I'm just gonna have to eat it, and we're feeling bad about that. With this twenty eight million dollars, this person That's must right. have had it must be worth fifty billion. <laughs> yeah. So what, whatever. It, it's like whatever. I did not oh watch my God. it. Uh, I did I did hear about it. I I did watch. Oh my God! You couldn't avoid it. I mean, there was. The the news, the mainstream news was, you would have thought they were all getting, you know, tickled under the covers because they were all so giddy about it. It was, it was almost weird the, to me the, who how was giddy. giddy. The, the announcers, the news, the, the news people. Yeah, they were like, "Oh my god, it's so exciting! It's so exciting! They're going up in space! It's amazing!" You know, and it's like, and I could get, I could get behind the whole. Wally Funk thing. I thought that was cool. I thought that, yeah. you know, the fact that she got to go up and, you know, her story is great. But the rest of it, I just kind of went, what? I mean, it, it's neat. It, it's kind of neat. Uh, but I don't, you know, it, it was, by the way, do you remember a week ago, there was another, another guy one. who did this whole thing? You know, it's like, I, they were so over the top giddy about it. You know, it was just, I don't know. It, it just it, it struck me as a little. I don't know odd if you well. follow. You probably don't follow. This guy's name is Nick Carter. He's a big Bitcoin guy, and I've been following him for a while. And he was talking about okay, and we 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 went up in 1969, and we've had all these technological advances, and we're talking about basically these billionaires going off into space, and it's like we have not advanced. We've regressed. With the technology advances that we've had, and we haven't been able to basically outdo what we did 50 plus years ago, this is a problem. Yeah. Well, this is what I was talking about, right? I mean, the, 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 we talked about this a little last week when, when Branson went up, where I was saying they're not advancing yeah. the technology at all. They're, in fact, it's like just to exactly to your point, it's regressing in some ways where. You know, and and the whole I, you know, look the the argument because I th this I wanted to see. I was like, I wanted to see what the the what they're saying right about this, and the argument seems to be that this is going to open up commercial space flight, and you know, and Bezos was like um, Bezos, bit Jeff Bezos. I've got to you can call him. That. You've I been calling him Bezos for. Yeah, Ever. I, you might as well I don't keep know. Calling anyway, Bezos. my wife corrects me every time I say it. She's like, "It's not Bezos. It's not Bezos. It's um, Jeffrey." <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Doctor Evil. Uh, <laughs> he is looking like, a little Doctor Evil these days. Uh, he is really. Um, but you know, they were saying basically this was you know his argument was this is going to open up the technologies and 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 all of this industry for companies that would open up the commercialization and he and he used the analogy of uh airplane flight and he said you know the the argument was 
in the early days of uh, airline flight, it was only the rich who could fly, you know, the, and that, that was brought down through the commercialization and democratization of the technology and, you know, the ever more efficient creation of it and blah, blah, blah. So now everybody can fly. And I come back to my same thing where I go, I, I just don't see the market for it because there's nowhere to go. Unlike an airline flight where it's quite, it's quite clear where you're going, right? You know, I'm going from LA to New York here. Where are you going except up and then down? You no, know, it's a great point. And when, I don't know if you saw it launched this week in China, they launched one of their new rails again that goes, I think it's 378 yeah. miles per hour. It's, it's it amazing. Would say if you, you could go to New, between New York and Chicago in something like two hours or th- less than yeah, three hours. That's right. Like, oh, my gosh. Now, this is fantastic. This is what we need, <laughs> we need more of right now. Right. Faster that's travel. That's the kind of on technology we want to be pushing. Right. Exactly. I, and, you know, I, anyway, it's uh, it was they did it. They went up in space and and we'll see what we'll see what happens, you know, and I, I you know, to me, I want to see them push the I, you know, I'm ready for the next moon launch. Right. I'm ready for the next lunar mission, because that to me is the really interesting stuff. Or, you know, getting getting something, uh, and I guess this is underway, where they're getting a, a probe ready to go to Mars that's actually going to come back. That's not, you know, not just going to go and stay, but it's actually going to go and come back. That, to me, is the, that's but the that's, exploration that, that is really you know, pushing we, the bounds. We have of, to think a little bit further out here. So if you think 50 years out, then the possibility, of course, exists that you could go to the moon or you could go to mars right this is so so yeah, to, to take your point yeah. in yes when when uh, air travel became democratized they i want to go to vegas or i want to go to paris or whatever I, yes i can do that well they will be able to go places it's just right now there's there's nothing to do but i'm waiting for that that first mars casino i am there man I'm checking that out. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna go, yeah. That nine month trip to go hang out in front of a slot at machine. The red planet, That's Joe. And I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go all in. And <laughs> Joe with his big fruity drink, taking nine months yeah. to get out there. Hey, anyways, uh, the thing that almost shut down the internet yesterday. I don't know if you watched this, but was the the interview on um, Arc Investments event called the B Word Bitcoin. Uh, where you had yeah. Elon. I did not oh see this. Oh, my God. I, I was watching. There was 100,000 people or something watching it at the same time. It was on YouTube. Is that right? Uh, it was a it was a free conference, and it was... I somehow yeah, missed it Kathy this. Kathy yeah. Wood, who runs ARK Investments. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah. Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey and some other guy. <laughs> or the other one was moderating <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they, they talked about basically the future of Bitcoin. Uh, so Elon came out for the first time and said that he actually. I was wondering why Bitcoin was up about eight percent yesterday. Oh uh, well, yeah, I looked it, at my. It hit. It, it it's got a lot of buyers at that right below thirty thousand level. So there's that. But it, yes, there was a lot of positive. Uh, you had you did have Elon come out and say he owns Bitcoin, mostly Bitcoin, some Ethereum, and some Dogecoin. So he did as a first time he came out and actually says personally he owns these things. So there, right. there's that, but. Yeah, they then at the end they asked Jack Dorsey, you know, what do you think the future of Bitcoin is? And he says the future of Bitcoin is world peace. Now I'm okay. Oh my now, god. Now hey, first of all, I like Jack Dorsey. And I, I love and I'm loving this bald head long beard thing that he's rocking. Uh yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. But yeah. yes. Uh going from Bitcoin now to world peace is a bit of a stretch. Mind yeah. you, pass the bong, Jack. But yeah. I did like what they talked about the fact that uh, when you think about a lot of the social issues that are going on with people that cannot can only pay for things with with paper dollars, and they, agreed. And they, I, there's I, no I, yeah. freedom. There's no way to to grow their businesses. There, t- there's people taking twenty, thirty percent cuts when they're dealing in dollars. And that's why you have what's going on in El Salvador and maybe Venezuela and some of these other countries where if you if you open up financial markets to the to a regular human being around the world, it could cut out a lot of inequality. 
I don't disagree with so that. So to all. that, I, I can see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, 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 you outlined that a couple of episodes ago, and I thought that was really, I thought that was really interesting. The whole DeFi and sort of the unbanked. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's just a really interesting trend. You know, I just, you know, I mean. You know, it's, uh, well, it's, uh, what's Jack, so many is we don't have to. Do, this is not a Bitcoin podcast, yeah. but what's interesting is I just feel I I, I figure I, every time I see Jack Dorsey, I always feel like he's going to bring out an acoustic guitar and start singing. Yes, you know, and he like, should. You know, a, and I would listen. A Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young yeah. song, right? You know, but he yeah he he was saying that if Bitcoin was around before Twitter was founded, uh, Twitter's business model would be entirely different. He can say that now, but what Elon right. Elon was first of all. It's very, very hard to listen to an interview with Elon Musk. And I get it. He's got a thousand <laughs> thoughts going through his head at the same time. And it's very difficult for him right. to communicate those. But it is challenging to listen. I, th- I thought that it, a better interview might be actually in the written word. Might be a better way to take it in this interview. But he was, what was interesting that talking about the currency and the payment structure Bitcoin layer one, obviously you can't have a payment structure on that. It's too slow. But the Lightning Network is your secondary layer where you're seeing a lot of progress. That's what you're seeing going on in El Salvador. And that's what you see, you know, obviously the the, the primary layer of the Federal Reserve. You, you can't, there's no monetary uh, back and forth going on there. What, what, how are we doing this? We're doing it on like a third or fourth layer where you have Visa and you have MasterCard, you have banks and those things. So as you get those things built on the Bitcoin layer, this thing's really going to take off. And I think we're, we're really close to seeing some massive innovation happen and other countries are going to lead because they have to. They, cause there yeah. is this inequality and really for the most part in the United States, Outside of some of the things we talked about a few episodes ago, most people can get a bank account. Well, yeah, and we move, you know, the the U.S. historically moves at glacial speeds when it comes to this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, there's been all these threats in Congress about, you know, regulating this stuff and banning this stuff. And, you know, I mean, you know, which very little of this is going to happen. So there's there there's going to remain here in the U.S. some uncertainty for a while. Um, whereas in some of these smaller countries that are, that are really willing to sort of take a lead on this, they, they, they're like, you know, they, you know, they have no F's to give, you know what I mean? Well, so they they're have just, they're, to, they're, they're, they're ready yeah, to go. Yeah. I mean, especially yeah, exactly. like El Salvador yeah. that bases their entire economy off the U S dollar. It kills right. them when we put more dollars into circulation, which we've done at trillions of dollars over the last 12 months. And so that kills them. That means that their money is worth less. It's only helping people in the U.S. because they're getting that cash. Yeah. No, people That's right. in El Salvador aren't getting dollars. Basically, they're seeing That's it right. go down to nothing. I mean, look what's happened to the Mexican peso in the last 20 years. It's gone. It's almost worthless compared to the dollar. And a lot of that yeah. is the U.S. is doing. So if you're in Mexico, you're thinking there's got to be a better way. And there is. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, maybe we'll yeah. shoot. This is the, the Bitcoin episode. Yeah, well, we should. I mean, we should. I mean, we we threatened to do that. We should do a special episode on this at some point. That'd be two, fun. yeah, two people that don't be, know a horrible yeah. amount about Bitcoin talking about the future of Bitcoin. That's what everyone right. wants and, to listen yeah, to, and something that makes it approachable and easy to understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's get to the news. Um, and we've got we've got some really fun, interesting stories to talk about uh, this episode. Um, and it opens up with our favorite platform of the last uh, six or seven months, uh, our friends at Clubhouse. Uh, and yay, everybody can stand up and cheer now because the headline as comes to us courtesy of TechCrunch, Clubhouse is now out of beta and open to everybody. So the article opens up by saying, one year later, Clubhouse is finally out of beta. The company announced on Wednesday, that would be yesterday as we record this, that it would end its wait list and invite system and open everything up to everybody. Now anybody can follow Clubhouse links, hop into a creator's community, or join any public event. Clubhouse is also introducing a real logo ooh, that will look familiar. It's basically a slightly altered version of the waving emoji the company had already used. 
Clubhouse will still hold on to its app portraits, introducing a new featured icon from the Atlanta music scene to ring in the changes. Uh, the invite system has been an important part of our early history, said Clubhouse founders Paul Davidson uh, and uh, Rohan Seth. Uh, they note that adding users in waves and integrating new users into the app's community through town halls and orientation sessions helped Clubhouse grow at a healthy rate without breaking. But... We've always wanted Clubhouse to be open, and the article goes on to explain a little more about this um, this new opening. So, Clubhouse lives, I guess. Joe, is that the uh, is that over overarching thing here? I mean, is this is this meaningful? Do we care? Yes, we we probably should care because I I think that initially I thought that this would be a large social media platform. But I don't think that's the ultimate purpose. I think it's a it's a niche platform where content creators, content entrepreneurs can build their audiences where you can have calls with your twenty to thirty, you know, key fans or key supporters. And what I'm seeing, I mean, when look at I told you what it was the last episode of the one before, I'm like, I'm kinda down on Clubhouse because we didn't attract the kind of people as many people as we thought we should for the Continent Book Tour. And then I talked with uh, Mike Stelzner about it, who was one of our guests on the show, and he said, well, how'd you do? And I just actually sent him the stats on it. And I said, well, overall, we had, I think, 1,300 total. We averaged about 120 or 130 total uh, people per clubhouse session with an average of something like 13 to 15 minutes of engagement each time and he's basically like those are amazing stats and now if i think about it they are amazing stats i don't know what i was thinking like we should get a thousand people or something like that but the more and more i talk to some of the uh my creator coin brethren at rally about what they're doing because they're linking it to membership and i know we're going to talk about patreon later but they're linking these things to membership where you can have members and you can gate access in there and these members can meet on a regular basis so for a, a group of people, I think we have to get past the, oh, I'm getting on, I don't know what, there's all this noise, to if there's a creator we follow or two or three creators we follow, it is a great place where you can have ongoing conversations with a group of people, just like you would on Discord, uh, just ca- like you would on your Patreon group. Uh, so I think we have to say, oh, Clubhouse is not in the Twitter, Facebook um Instagram discussion, it should be in the Patreon uh, Discord discussion of closed knit communities. That's my take on it. I think you're, I, you know, and, and we, you know, when when we were when we were really hot and uh, and talking about the 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 launch of this thing back earlier this year, uh, we talked a little bit about this. Where you know, I think we both agreed at the time that 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 Clubhouse would be better served if it had remained a little bit and perhaps this was the plan all along and this was sort of the you know the 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 widening of the net so that it could actually close the net at some point um but we said you know it it would be better served as a niche community where there was a level of exclusivity and that you felt being a privileged member of getting in and and it was sort of you know literally a clubhouse right (laughs) you know where where you went to participate in closed events. And to me, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, Personally, and we'll talk a little more about what Zoom has been doing here of late, uh, later in the show, but to me, I, I, this feels transitory to me. This feels like, you know, we're just, all we're doing is using this until the better thing comes along. And I think the better thing is coming along. Um, pretty quickly here. So this feels like it's going to be exactly what you said, a a place where people can go into memberships and go into private clubs and have a gated access to be, you know, a membership. And it's a benefit of membership that you get access to so-and-so who's going to be on stage and you might be able to talk to them and all these, you know, fun and interesting things rather than the sort of open platform where everybody comes in and gabs about various topics. And it's sort of the audio version of Twitter. Yeah. So I think you're exactly right. But to me, it feels temporary. It feels like this is going to be, you know, 2021, maybe 2022's darling, but, but 
it, it will quickly be replaced by by something I, else. I, that's that's what it feels I, like. Yeah, obviously, there's a there is a lot of copycats going on with with Twitter and Facebook and the technology. But if you take away, why are, we're down on it because it hit it hit this bubble, right? If you think about, I mean, we just talked about Bitcoin a little little while ago. I'm down on it because I'm down on it because I don't see the differentiator. I I almost don't care about how much it's getting used right now. What I what I don't see is the differentiator. I don't see how it can't be copied and made better, right? The the and I've and that's been something you know I've I've said from the very beginning, which is the technology behind what they do is not they don't have like a TikTok algorithm, they don't have um, you know some proprietary way to drop in to the audio, and in fact they outsource that entire technology infrastructure. They don't have a terribly differentiated user interface. I just don't see how they're different from any of but, these other copycats that already have the audience that they strive for. Well, they but they were first. They they were they have really the, they have but the that, first. that that that's never predicated success. It has for Microsoft. It I mean if you it, it look look at where they're at right now. I mean if we if they didn't have this big boom up like i mean because I, I was talking or talking to somebody else about this and i said okay what well, you had the big bitcoin ico boom of 17 and then bitcoin went up to twenty thousand, and then it went back down and just died into 3500 everyone was down on it but if it just kept its if you didn't look at the big way up big up and down you're just like oh man this is great it's just growth over a long period of time that's where clubhouse is at they got their big bubble bump up because of the pandemic and we were all poo pooing it because they got then they got this big valuation because of it if those two things didn't happen and it was just growing over a small period and they're working out their bugs they added now you know the direct message capability through back channel now they're adding users. It's open to everyone. You know, I don't know if the stat about that the Signal Fire, Josh Constantine talked about in Signal Fire, it says a five hundred thousand daily rooms. I don't know how many of those are real. I don't know how many people but there's something here and they're working it out. And I think that their their advantage is focus. Their advantage over Twitter and Facebook and every other thing that comes out is it's just a feature. In Twitter and Facebook, Clubhouse, this is what they do, and they're focused on it all but, the time. That's their difference. That's their so. Advantage. So just to flip that on its okay. head, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's just a feature. That's all we're talking about here, and it's very hard to build a company around a single feature. And so, and we've you know the 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 internet and Web two point if we will, is littered with the carcasses of companies that have tried to build scale on simply being a feature of something bigger. And so this is that's that's why I think they they don't have, you know, they don't have a defensible position really as, you know, unless they add something that is truly differentiated that's that it, it literally drop in audio is just a feature. And so you've got to have something else to have sustainability and I just think they don't have it yet. Well, first of all, I think that you you obviously could be right, but it might be enough to have it might be enough right now what they have. It it really might be. They don't need they don't right. need a billion they don't need a billion users. Maybe. They they well, don't really need that it could be a very good small business. It could You're be right. A great Absolutely small yes. business. Be yes, that there, there's no doubt about in, that. But it is not the unicorn that 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 uh but if you're yeah, that, if you're a content to be. creator and you're trying to generate revenue, Clubhouse right now is one of those top ways that you can generate revenue. You can create a gated room that people have to pay to get into, or like if you have like we have Tilcoin, we could create a a room that if you have enough Tilcoin, then you get access in. You can do a lot of different stuff with membership programs. You can integrate it into what you're doing with Patreon. There's a lot of things you can do right now. And it's very hard to do that model with Twitter Spaces, and it's impossible to do that model with no. Facebook's whatever they call theirs. Right, but you can do it with. I mean, we'll talk about it in a bit. You can do it with Zoom. Can you do this? 
I don't know if you could do this yeah. with Zoom. Well, let's talk about we'll, we'll talk about you that whenever yeah, you we'll want talk to about, talk we'll about talk about it, about it later. Yeah, obviously you yeah, do yeah. the programming for the show, and I don't have any say. So why don't you just? <laughs> <laughs> well, here let's talk okay. about it now. Let's talk about let's, let's talk about it now because it was we were saving it for later in the show. But let's talk about it now. So the big news coming from Zoom. There's two big items of news coming from Zoom. Um, the first is is that they are a, they made a big acquisition, which of course everybody has been waiting for because they are, you know, again going public, they like had to do something like with all this money. Billion dollar something, right? Oh, yeah. Huge. Big, yeah. Big, big acquisition. Um, and they it's a company called Five Nine, um, which is a uh, a contact center uh, uh, application. And so they've acquired this, which makes all the sense in the world if you think about it as customer service and what you're trying to do um, and the way that you're doing, you know, hybrid work from home workforces. This is a perfect business to business kind of application for enhancing Zoom's uh, ability to deliver more scalable infrastructure like services. So this is a, a, a great, interesting acquisition. That's not what we're talking about here with the clubhouse thing. Just wanted to note it. We'll of course link that in the, uh, in the show notes. Um, what we want to talk about is the launch of what is being called on zoom. Um, and it's at basically on zoom.us something we mentioned, I don't know when early, late last year that we hoped we thought zoom would do, uh, which it has now done which is basically provide for a platform for content creators to build public available or private available online events and they act as sort of a guide, a sort of, you know, slide share, if you will, or a, you know, virtual guide, if you will, of all these online events, like a YouTube platform, if you will, of these events that get um, put up. And basically, you can have private events there, you can have public events there, you can, uh, I've, I've signed up for one, you can actually have them cost money. So you can have like free tickets, but you can also have premium tickets, you know, which gets you into the event in a guaranteed seat. You can restrict access to only those and it's all done through the Zoom platform and your Zoom account. So when you go in through your Zoom account, it's all it's already there. The monetization is already there. It's pretty neat, I have to say. Um, the, the if you go to onzoom.us, you'll you'll see it. Um, they've got them separated into categories like education, business and networking, food and drink, um, and of course, what we'll link to also is the blog post from Zoom, basically announcing uh, the actual launch. So this is what I mean, right? This this to me. The monetization is there. If I'm a content, especially if I'm a business marketer or or a or a content creator focused in on uh, something that isn't very clubhousey, you know, an audience that isn't very clubhousey savvy, this is where I'm going, right? This is this is where I'm going to start to create my weekly show, um, where I'm going to do my yoga show or I'm going to do my online fitness show or I'm going to do my, you know, how to save money doing Bitcoin show, you know, so it becomes a very focused version of what YouTube is kind of right now for content creators. But this and I'm and I haven't done enough investigation to see how you get ranked on the first page and sure. all that kind of stuff. But um, but I'm assuming there's some sort of ranking by, you know, by either money or by downloads or attendance or something like that. Anyway, I think it's, I find it fascinating. What's amazing between this is why the, the opportunity for Zoom is because the customer for Zoom in this is the content creator. Yes. On YouTube, the customer is not the content creator. The customer is the advertiser. This That's is right. such an Great important point. distinction that people don't think about. And this is why if I go and I start something on Zoom, I have many different ways that I can generate revenue as a content entrepreneur immediately uh, where it takes me much, much longer. Now, obviously, if you have an audience already, it's a lot easier on Zoom. And again, I don't, I, I'm with you. I don't know how, how findability, discoverability works yet, but this is just super smart. They they could they could oh, turn yeah so so what happens is they are a, a video conferencing technology for the most part correct zoom that's what zoom is and they are morphing yeah, into a, 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 yeah. a event company like we've never seen before holding thousands of simultaneous events that are revenue generating at the same time over and above the subscription fee. 
So, yeah, yeah, it's it's it, it, it's it's amazing. And and what amazes me the most about this is that they didn't they didn't sort of launch a handicapped version or a beta version of this. As far as I can tell by reading through the FAQ about how to become uh, an event host, it's it's out of the gate fully featured. You know, you can do ticket sales, you can do, you know, and it's already integrated with PayPal and with Stripe. Um, you can have multiple events. You can, you know, uh, there are there are so many different things that are just already there in terms of your ability to set up shop here um, that just sort of are out of the gate, you know, and they don't have, by the way, it doesn't have to be video. You can do audio as well. You can do just a phone call um, if you want. And, and it's, uh, you know, training webinars. I mean, just, I mean, it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays with people that want to create their communities and need it, you know, need that infrastructure like a YouTube, but just exactly to your point are looking for something that's not going to be riddled with ads and, you know, subject to the algorithm and, and all those kinds of things. It's, if I'm, if I'm a video events platform of any kind, this is disturbing. This is, I mean, Zoom has already yeah. been doing corporate events. So that's not a thing, but not, but of now, of course, it, it's, <laughs> and especially at their price points, uh, just for subscription, it, this is, yeah, this is, that's right. Very tough to stay relevant as another platform. So good. I, yeah. I, I have, I don't see anything bad. I mean, obviously, you and I talked about this before that they should do it. And I'm sure they were listening to this podcast and somebody got right on there. Of that. course they were. Of course <laughs> but, they were. Absolutely. This is, this is really smart. And everybody's talking about, oh, you know, Facebook throwing a billion dollars of creators and YouTube throwing a billion dollars of creators and all this stuff. But here you have Zoom that has that's created a, a pretty amazing uh, revenue machine for content creators. And the only thing, again, the only thing I don't know is how are they, do they even have to drive audience? Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Well, they've got a they've got a huge audience built in, right? And so now it's just whatever, you know, so if if their if their entire audience includes all of us who signed up for Zoom and I I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but the, you know, it's in the tens if not hundreds of millions of people who signed up for a Zoom account over the course of 2020, they clearly did the math. Um, and said, how many of those, what percentage of them would want to become Zoom hosts and actually host their own event? And I'm sure they used the math of how many people started to set up virtual conferences, virtual, you know, and, and all the things that they were doing. And Zoom isn't that great for things like big conference events and, and those kinds of things. You know, it does have the breakout rooms and, and all of that. But the, uh, the, the real, the interesting part of this is that I'm sure they said, there's a good percentage of people who are going to want to host and we can get a piece of that, right? We can get a piece of that, you know, the entrance fees for all of those, you know, for all of those people who are going to set up the the platform. And by the way, I'm, I'm assuming that I did not read that they're taking a piece of your ticket price, but I'm yes. assuming they are I, at I, some I level. Believe, I but, believe they are, but the one, the I, they may not be because they, they, they say that you're doing it through PayPal and through Stripe. So, they they actually may not be taking a piece of it right now. They may they may start to add features or something like that. I haven't read enough into it to see if there actually is a you know is a, a commission that you pay to. Well, to and Zoom the other the, the other difference between something like a Udemy, which you might say, oh yeah, it's, it's nothing more than something like that. Um, Udemy has uh, their their on demand courses, and from what I can see from these courses on Zoom, they all have a set time. Like they are, yeah, it is that, a, it is a live is event I, of some kind. Exactly. So it's a live event platform versus a on demand platform. So that's a differentiator as well. So. That's right. That's the, that's, that's the, and that's why I'm, I'm so interested in following this as it pertains to something like clubhouse. I just me and this is, you know, look, you know, it's like, this is the part of the show where you go, okay, boomer, um, you know, cause for me, I look at this and go, if I, you know, and I am, I'm a content creator um, as part of the, the, you know, the content entrepreneur community and the content entrepreneur, you know, content inc thing. Um, 
you know, my, if I look at my audience as, and me as an entrepreneur, I'm going, I'm totally going zoom, not and, and why would that my audience why is, is not on clubhouse because there's a, it's a lot of my audience is not on clubhouse. One's audio one's video right my my audience is not on clubhouse my my audience does not you know my audience who tends to be you know sort of senior level managers uh and and cmos and leaders of marketing of mid-size to larger organizations that's my sort of core audience i would say in terms of my business um, they're not the, 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 um, the number of them from a percentage wise and is that are on zoom versus clubhouse and not to say that they've never been on clubhouse, but where they do their business, right? Where they actually go and consume their content. Zoom is far and away, far and away overweighted in terms of where they're going to get their content. So it's like if I offer up a clubhouse event versus a zoom event, my audience is by far going to go, oh, I'm coming to the Zoom event. That's easy. I understand it. I know how to do it. I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm in, right? And I have the benefit of doing slides. I have the benefit of doing video. I can do, um, I can do text. Um, you know, there's so many things that I can do that I can't do on Clubhouse because it's just audio. And I get the choice, right? That's the difference. I get the choice. I can do just audio if I want. But I can do audio with images. I can do a slide. I can do video. I can show a YouTube video. I can share my screen. I, All you right. Know, uh, it's just there's, there's I, so much I, more. I totally hear what you're saying. But let's just put this in perspective. Do you know when Zoom came out? Yeah. 2012. It's, it's, it's almost yeah, 10 years old around now. forever. Clubhouse That's right. is what? A year old? That's right. So, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you, I can even. I mean, you're saying, yeah, right now, of course, Zoom, because it's. It is a mature software program. Club, Clubhouse yes. is ten percent. That's my point. This is yeah, my but point. I'm, but I'm this saying is my is, point. If we have this conversation in a couple of years. You, you may have an audience on, or maybe you just tell your audience that this is where the this is where the party's happening. It's not happening on Zoom, or it's happening on Clubhouse. They'll go find you. I mean, like it's it's just the same thing with our Discord group oh. for the tilt. None of our audience, for the most part, was was using Discord, so we have to onboard them onto Discord and get them going. They were all using Slack. Well, we prefer Discord. So just have to onboard them, get them there, and now they're all happy as clams because they love Discord. But it just takes a while. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, I agree that you you can if you shine a bright enough light, the moths will come. I oh, I totally deep. agree with that. Yeah. That is- yeah, this is way too deep for this I, show. I agree with that. <laughs> All I'm suggesting is is that if I was going to invest in something, it would not be um, my first investment is not. This is the challenge that Clubhouse will have. It's it is built a very steep hill to climb because it is basing everything of its business on the fact that it's just a feature. So it, it, you are absolutely right. If Clubhouse starts to mature and add video and add things and add new features and add differentiation as part of its technology platform, well, okay. no doubt Why? it will evolve into something sophisticated. Here's the difference. The difference between Slack and Discord is Discord's a better technology than Slack, arguably, in terms of the way that it's that it's constructed. There are There are clear differentiators in Discord over Slack. And you know, I know there's passion on both sides of that fence, but uh, they're 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 equal in but weight it, in terms of bringing them to isn't a platform. Isn't saying that you're saying social audio is a feature? Isn't that like saying radio is a feature? No, I'm saying Clubhouse is a feature, not social audio, because there are social audio platforms that do more than what Clubhouse does. What? I am. T- you're totally losing me. And all Clubhouse does is I I, I do that all frequently. Clubhouse I does totally is lose social it. audio, <laughs> but it's a I don't it's not worth. I think you're being way it's too hard on Clubhouse. Maybe because maybe. your maybe your uh, experience was not as positive as it has been in other things such as that's Zoom. All, all I have, my friend, all I have, that's all I have in this world is my experience. You are not your audience. <laughs> Remember that. That is true. <laughs> that all is right, true. what else we got That here? is true. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to our next story here, and it is about Substack. 
Uh, this is an interesting one. And uh, by the way, uh, brought to us by friend and family of the show, Robert Katai. Hi, Robert. Uh, he's got a great first name. Um, <laughs> and uh, the article here is from Axios. And the headline is Substack makes its first major podcast investment. You see, Joe? Technology is evolving, evolving. Oh anyway, Substack is funding the launch of a new podcast network today called Booksmart Studios. Uh, it's the newsletter company's first major financial investment in podcasting. Substack sees the venture as a way to deepen its commitment to podcast publishing on its platform and as a case study for what's possible for independent podcast networks. We're in the early days of podcasting on Substack, but some podcasts are already making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year through the platform, said Substack co-founder Hamish McKenzie. Uh, love that name, Hamish McKenzie. Sounds like he should be drinking scotch. It sounds like uh, a kind the of Substack scotch, model actually. provides an. Yes. It does actually, yeah. What are you drinking? Well, I'm drinking some Hamish oh, McKenzie. Oh, that's an odd right. five. Uh, that's a great <laughs> five. <laughs> The Substack model provides a new and exciting avenue for podcasters and writers who want to break out of the old constraints, including to build a business or a portfolio of media offerings like Booksmart is doing. Uh, the article goes on to talk about some of the details here, which include some of the, uh, the podcasters who will be trying uh, it out um, and, uh, and also talking a little bit about how it works. What do you think? What do you th is, this, is this good for Substack? I mean, I know you're a little bit down on Substack these days, but... Um, is this a I'm, good move for them? Look, at, I'm I'm a little bit down on Substack because I don't, and I could be wrong. Somebody correct me, but uh, I see other places like Patreon and other pla like Discord. Maybe not Discord, but uh, the the creator has a little bit more control. Like for example, on Patreon, I, I can take my names anytime. Can you do that on Substack? Somebody t let me know. I don't I don't know if you can as easily um, do that as with others. But that said, if my goal as Substack is to create this, uh, look like a new kind of event company. It's funny because we just said that was Zoom, but it looks like sub all these things, people, businesses are competing with each other. So if I look at, okay, now they, they have, they're basically a text, I don't want to say text event company, but stay, stay with me on this. Now they're going into audio and then I could see them going into video and they're underwriting content creators to create these content experiences on all these different platforms. So it's an easy move for writers, Substack writers. What's the first movement of diversification that most writers make today? They do uh, audio. They move from writers, writing, textual, to not video, but just audio. And so that makes perfect sense for them to do that. And again, it comes back to these, you know, what, what's a good business model for a Substack creator, and I guess what it is, two hundred dollars they're charging, let's say, for an annual founding member to subscribe to this. So let's say you're a creator and you you want somebody to pay two hundred dollars to subscribe to your podcast membership, whatever you're delivering there. That's that's you know, if you get a thousand subs, again, this is a thousand true fans. You get a thousand th subs. That's two hundred thousand dollars a year. Have yeah. a Substack take their ten yeah. percent. That's meaningful. One hundred eighty thousand yeah. at the end of this. It is very, very meaningful. Uh, I don't know if you have you listened to Sam Harris's podcast by chance. Okay, I have. I have not. I'm not a regular listener, I've but listened, I have. Yeah, I same have thing. Heard I've before, listened to yes. a few here or there. But his model is interesting because he will go out with let's say a forty five minute or so podcast, and he'll say, hey, "Look, members get the hour and forty five or the two hours," and he is just rolling it in with his membership program. So this is just Substacks yeah. just taking what's already working and saying, okay, we got all these writers launching their own podcast. Go ahead. And then, of course, to get things started, they're underwriting a lot of these creators to do it and, and putting some uh, promotion behind it. So I think it's smart. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. They've got the money. It's a land grab right now. And this is a good move. It, uh, it, it, it I think I agree. Uh, and it, it seems to me that we're going to see more and more and more of this, right? So all of these platforms, you know, I, you know, I, I know we don't necessarily agree, but I, 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 I think when, when we look at companies like Clubhouse, Substack, 
uh, Patreon, um, you know, even some of the social media networks, right? You have Facebook and Twitter and, you know, those that are going to be Zoom, they're going to be offering up places for creators to build audiences and to, you know, and, and by the way, folks, this is all, you know, for the most part, rented land, um, you know, so when we think about this, they all have to add more than what they have, right? In terms of the portfolio of content types to be able to manage, to be able to, because just exactly to your point, newsletter writers are going to want to also podcast. Podcasts are also going to want to create email newsletters. They're also going to want to create websites. They're also, you know, this is the, the interestingly enough, I've, uh, I think this is one of the big challenges with the uh, OnlyFans idea, right? Which is, you know, they don't they don't really have the the, the ability to sort of create these sort of uh, homes for people to to you know to to create their 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 different kinds of you know whether it's an email newsletter whether it's a website whether it's a podcast you know so all of these platforms in some form or fashion are going to be starting to add to this portfolio it would not surprise me going back to our very you know original conversation it would not surprise me to hear clubhouse very soon start to say okay we're going to expand just beyond audio and we're going to add video or we're going to add uh, a recording capability so that you can actually have you know your own sort of page where you can have uh, archives of your clubhouse events where people can be members to it you know it would not surprise me to see them build a little more membership into into their infrastructure and i think that's that's the key trend that we see here with substack and it's i think it's only one that we're going to see repeated over and over and over again with some of these other companies i still think i mean i'm sorry i'm fixated on the clubhouse thing i think clubhouse will get purchased oh and i know that's oh you may be right i think you may that's be right. and it's and, going and, to and, be and, part yeah. of like you know substack let's just say substack could I mean, they're not big enough but they zoom Zoom could apps absolutely do it. They just spent fifteen billion dollars. Yep. Could they spend five on Clubhouse and not think twice about it? Absolutely could. Well, yeah, and that feeds right into my my my. It's commentary, not a rant or a rave. A little later, but yes, exactly. I I do not disagree with that at all. That Clubhouse could get purchased and probably should get well, again, purchased. Well, again, and soon. and people we've talked about this. So if you've listened to this, you can. But but we have new listeners every day. So let's talk about this. There is so much money in the corporate coffers of these big companies right now and they have to do something with it if they just leave it it's funny because i was listening to the uh, elon musk talk about it and he says when they have money in a european bank they have negative interest rates right now they're getting charged to hold money in a bank right now right and you're getting basically nothing what is it, 0.25%? You're getting nothing to hold any kind of cash in a financial institution today if you're a corporation. You have to do something with that money if you are first response to your stakeholders, to your shareholders. So you have to make that money yep. make money. So what are you going to do? You're going to go buy things. So over the next 18 months, and right now there's still, I mean, the, the money printer is still printing. Paper dollars everywhere, all over the place. So you're going to see that happen, I think, you know, I guess it's up to the investors of Clubhouse on whether they want to do it and how much they they think is is in the runway for them. But absolutely, should is going is right now on the radar of many companies to get purchased. Totally, and I I think I still yeah. think well, I said I'd, before I thought ten billion was the number. I still think it's the number, even with these diminished expectations. <laughs> well, we'll see about that part. But yeah, I I I don't disagree that at all that 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 they should and could very quickly become purchased because i that just to your point there's so much money that they need to be that need well it gets to my it gets to my commentary which i'll speak to uh in, in and, just well, a then, then just just um, to put a wrapper on this I, did we talk about the signal yeah. fire uh blog post last week no and i'll put we this didn't. in the show yeah, notes yeah, too because yeah. it's interesting because signal fire is, is a blog it's from um uh, y Y Wan and or Y Y she goes by Y Y Yan Ling Wan and Josh Constein and they put together a whole creator economy mar market map, and they basically make the contention that there's 50 million people around the world that consider themselves content creators. 
which it, it, honestly that might be a low number uh which is scary to think about this is why you're having the sub stacks and the zooms and all this go on because you have all, a whole new group of people that have never built a business before they need the picks and the axes to do it it's so everyone's throwing money at them right now it's crazy but i wanted to i, I thought that 50 million now that's the fr- i don't know if you've seen another number i haven't anyone put a number on how many people are in the creator economy yeah. no i have not i have not seen any sort of you know but, I, but as we've talked about before figuring out your total addressable market is a fuzzy yes. science at best but but you know 50 million is a good uh, a number is 5 million is good it doesn't matter it's a, 50, it's, it's a lot exactly. there's a lot out there 50 50 million 60 million you know 40 million 100 million it's a lot of people it's a you know it's a lot of people it's a real it's a real market it's a it's a, it's a significant market and you're st- you're you're seeing exactly that you're seeing lots and lots of investment in the picks and axes that will actually help those content creators do what they want to do and it's building it is building a new economy it's uh it's you know it's, it's, true. it's, it's funny uh, uh sarah mitchell who we know and love in australia yeah uh, um with uh, her copywriting expertise, what's her what's her website so I can give her some love? Goal, global copywriting. What's the uh, That's typeset? It. I think um, talk yeah, talk about it. And look I'll look, look up where Sarah Mitchell is at. But she came on to the we were she was having a discussion with somebody about revenue generation on our Discord group, and she said for, it's funny. She said first rule of Tilt Club is diversify your revenue. And I just that hit yeah, me so hard right. because this is what we're trying. This is why we do this show because we're trying to get in marketers too. We're trying to get them to think of look, you can't be beholden to one of these platforms. If you just are on Substack or you just are on YouTube or you and that's all your that's the only way you're getting revenue, you are setting yourself up to for for failure because your destiny is in their hands. So you've got to make sure. So that's why I love a lot of these options coming out because if you're a creator now and you've got, oh, you're generating some revenue on Substack, you're doing something by your email newsletter, you've got maybe a mini event, you've got a course structure that you're doing, you've got maybe some advertising on YouTube, you've got a podcast spot, whatever the case is, right? You got seven or eight of these revenue lines coming in, you're very well protected and you're you're primed for growth when one of those takes off. So, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. It's a great. It's a great piece of advice. By the way, Sarah is at globalcopywriting.com. dot com. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for your empirically proven favorite part of the show, which of course is our rants and raves section, where Joe and I go off in a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave that makes us feel like the shape of Jeff Bezos' a spaceship, or that makes I don't know. I'm not, not that 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 joke's not going to go very far. So uh, makes us feel bad or good. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, Anyway, uh, would you yeah, like to go, go first or shall I go first? I, go first? Um, I just wanted to throw a shout out. We, we didn't cover it. It was in the show flow. But there is an interview that was done. Uh, it's This is on The Verge. Uh, but I think it was the Decoder podcast of Patreon CEO Jack Conte. Um, basically, the title yeah. of this one is Patreon CEO on why creators can't depend on platforms. I really loved this article. Uh, it is worth some time and energy to go into because it talks about the importance of membership uh, as sort of the new structure for a lot of creators rather than what it used to be. If, if you were a musician, you say, oh, I'll sell my song or I'll sell my album. Now everything revolves around a subscription membership, which is a basket of benefits, if you will, for a monthly fee. Uh, it. Go if you get a chance, read it. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, thanks to I think it's pronounced Ozzy Kokol, uh, who put this in the uh, Discord group, and I want to give him some love. So just worth going through my real. I don't know if this is this is more of a commentary or more of just if you want thirteen minutes of your time to be in awe and scared to death. This is a <laughs> Wall Street Journal video report. I don't know if you saw this, Robert. It's fascinating. It's inside TikTok's highly secretive algorithm. I did. Did you see watch that. it? Yes, I did. I did. It's first it's, of all, you know, hats off I mean, to Wall Street Journal because this yeah. is some excellent journalism on on what they did and put together. And they had thousands of bot accounts to figure out what hit and what didn't. And they go through one particular account called Kentucky 96 and going through and figuring out how how quickly TikTok figured out 
the 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 loves and passions and interests of Kentucky ninety six. So there's a couple things. Back to our show last week. TikTok does have an amazing algorithm that, that is for sale right now that a lot of corporations are going to buy. And this yep. is kind of the proof of it in this video. And it also is really, really scary. So you should watch this as anybody interested in marketing. You should know what TikTok is doing with their algorithm. You might learn a, learn a few things. I know I did. But here's the sad thing. And here's what I can't figure out. This just came out yesterday, I think, the data on uh, the mortality rate of United States citizens. Did you see that, that the average mortality went down over the past year of like almost two years? Um, yeah. Life, is, life expectancy. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Life expectancy. Thank you. <clears throat> and yes, yeah. we were ta- it, we were talking about COVID and people dying from that. And absolutely, that was a contributor. But a lot of it is in accidents and suicides. And look, at, I'm not making one with the other, Robert, but you and I have talked about what social media can do to people. And watching this video and then at the same time seeing those life expectancy numbers come in, it scares me. It just frankly scares me because I I think there is a link somewhere. So I'm just going to put that out there. On a high note. Wow. That's on a high note. I don't know. Is it? I I might be just, it may have just been a coincidence, but there's, there's something, there's something there because what happens is it, and it shows you in the video, it takes you from general videos that millions of people are watching and engaging in down to off the rails, niche content where you can just get sucked sure, into. And yeah. then once they get you in that niche content, that's all they start throwing you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Conspiracy echo chamber theories, is real for sure. All sorts of things. Yeah. And I, I mean, they just played it yeah. in the video. They played the ones on talking about suicide and depression. It's scary. It, it, it's scary. So, yeah. And there's not, not really any, any regulation on any of this. And uh, I don't know if there should be, maybe there should be. It's a it's a it's a fascinating question. I mean, this is one of the things that was you know covered pretty well in depth as what in that uh, that social media yes, documentary. Same, as same well, type of was, thing. Same type of thing. Know, but it's anyways, yeah, it's interesting exactly. as a content creator, as a marketer, how the how the sauce is being made here, and and that's or how the sauce no. is being made, <laughs> right. and, and you go yeah. <laughs> go deep into it on yeah. this one. Yeah. So. And and just to be clear, we are the sausage. Mm-hmm. Just so yeah. Isn't you know. oh jeez. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And Anyways, what do you anyway, got? Uh, I got something. Well, it's a little more positive, I hope. Um, it, it is a, a commentary, not necessarily a rant or a rave. And the, what we'll link to in the show notes is uh, from Axios. And the headline is Ad Tech Bounces Back. Um, and the article really goes to, to uh, the number of transactions and mainly uh, companies going public. Um, in terms of transactions, but also acquisitions as well uh, across ad tech, marketing tech, and digital content, which I found fascinating. Um, the article, I think, buries the lead a little bit because it really focuses in on ad tech, you know, talking about Outbrain, talking a little bit about Taboola going public, um, all of these things that are uh, that are going on in the in the in the uh, in the environment right now, which I look at and I go, I looked at the actual data, and yeah, it's grown. Ad tech has definitely grown and bounced back a little bit. But to me, the more interesting thing is how Martech and digital content have really outpaced uh, the marketplace. Because um, to me, ad tech is an old story that is, you know, not long for this world. But digital content and Martech, on the other hand, is a really interesting one. The, so I actually went and looked, and we'll put in the show notes, the uh, the actual study that the Axios is actually um, looking at, which comes from Luma Partners, uh, and it's a really good video. And I want to just encourage you, if you're interested in sort of the Q2 21, you know, sort of stat of status of the market when it comes to MarTech acquisitions, ad tech acquisitions, and digital content acquisitions, and all of these spaces, they just do it. They just do a really nice job. I just think they've they've done a um, a, a really uh, really great job in terms of. Now the video is a little dry. I will I'll say that, but the 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 content is is absolutely fantastic. 
And what I just want to say as a piece of commentary here is that the headline is not about ad tech bouncing back. There's been tons of headlines, you know, in the trade rags uh, around how ad spending is back. And we talked about last week, the marketing spending is, you know, questionable. I happen to think it's up. And I think I agree with Joe 100 percent that, you know, a lot of what we're seeing here as a percentage of revenue being spent is because we had money left in the bank. We're not actually needing to spend a percentage of revenue anymore because we've got stuff saved up. And so what you are seeing, however, are these big tech companies making a lot of acquisitions and you're seeing a lot of smaller companies go public. So my commentary, or I guess my cautionary tale is, as you're starting to think about acquisition of new technologies, just remember that there are a lot of these smaller technology companies that are not getting picked off in this, you know, put a little asterisk here next to Clubhouse. There's not, there are some of these technology companies are not getting picked off by the larger companies in, because they have such amazing technology. It is simply because the larger company has so much cash, they can either buy them for the client list or they can buy them, quite frankly, to take them off the shelf so that they are no longer a, an option and they can kill the technology. And that, that's happened before in the early 2000s. It happened right after the 2008-2009 uh, crisis and it will happen again. And I'll just tell you that a lot of these smaller technologies that you may be looking at or that you may be using will be acquired, but quite frankly, may not be being acquired because they're such amazing technology and they're going to continue to support it. It may be just because, quite, because quite frankly, they're going to kill it off and, um, and buy it for the client list, which includes you. Um, the other thing is these companies that are going public right now are doing so via SPAC, which we've talked about on the show before and probably should include even that in its own special episode. But, you know, I was I saw one stat that said in 2021, there were 111, which is more than almost double what we saw in 2020 and, you know, and, and, and 2019 in terms of the number of companies that are now going public via SPAC. It is the hot thing to do to get yourself wrapped up into a SPAC and go and go and just become a public company. And that there are implications to that. Uh, and we should just be aware that a lot of these smaller companies that go public, that doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden amazingly stable and amazingly, you know, great companies all of a sudden because they went public. This is a hot trend that is likely to continue for a little while as we have so much surplus of cash in the marketplace but it will it will eventually ebb uh and we'll see where a lot of these companies end up well, it's so a, yeah it's anyway, another it yeah grain of salt grain of salt as you as you go look at this stuff but the loom escape uh, or the, excuse me the luma market report here is just a really great primer on what's yeah, going on on, right on the on the specs i mean it it's it is now but the good thing is it's another way that people can take their companies public it's also fraught with um you have to do your due diligence because <laughs> oh, some boy. yeah no they're, they're, they don't have to go through all the hoops to become public because somebody can just buy them you know create that shell company as you were talking about so it is a little bit scary yeah, so that's if you're right going to invest in a spac company you need to you need to really look at it see if it's not yeah that's right not. that's and that, that's all I'm, all I'm suggesting is eyes open because there there will be people who make money on this there will be lots of lots of lots of upside in this in the short term um, but just go in with your eyes open with this stuff yep good deal well where are you where what 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 what, what, where, what, 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 uh, what? well actually it's funny I'm preparing I think that I'm going to see you at the Build a Better Agency conference. I, isn't that fun? Up. I know it's our fun? first. It's my yeah. first one since February. In my first in person speech. I have actually butterflies in my stomach around this whole thing. It's like it's very it's exciting. First in person for me since February of 2020. I don't know about you. First in person. First in person for me since March 9th of uh, okay. Of so 2020. There, you, there you go. Um, yeah. So yeah. getting ready for that. That'll be in Chicago. So I'll see you there, and I'll be, a lot of our friends will be there as well. So it'll be almost like old times. We'll see. Oh, it'll be a reunion for sure. We're going to see Jay Bear. 
Um, we'll, uh, we'll see, of course, uh, uh, Drew, um, you know, uh, who is of course the leader of, 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 uh, build a better agency. And of course the agency management Institute, I mean, it's just going to be a great, great couple yeah, of and days. By the way, if you're just wondering, you have to be vaccinated to attend that event. So it's a, uh, that is correct. That is correct. Or, or have had a, a test, test within. Yeah. 72 yeah. Hours. 72 okay. hours. Very good. I think. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually going to get ready for that. I got to get th- that uh, done pretty shortly. Uh, we're going to, we're going to have some yeah. family vacation time right before that. So looking, looking forward to that. And how about you, sir? Uh, I am just heads down right now with client work, which has been amazing. So it's been an amazing summer and I am too getting ready for this trip and starting to put together my presentation and, get everything ready to go. So, uh, I'm getting excited about some, some travel and I'm actually going to go see my, I'm actually going to take my very first trip. This won't be my first flight. My first flight will actually be the weekend before that. I'm going to go see my brother up in, uh, Berkeley nice. and see some family for the first time. Yeah. For, for the first time, literally in a wow. year and change. Yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully the variant won't get in our way and we can still do no life. Not. No, hopefully so, not. No. Yes, exactly. that's exactly right. Hope, hoping yes. for life. I would like. That's what would you the, like? That's the I theme would of like the show. Life, please, I vote like life. Life. I like life. Life. life is I want good. life. It's good. Life. Life. Well, speaking of life, we're going to sign off and get back to ours, and let you get back to yours. And if you want to get all the goodness of this podcast, show notes, or dive into the other 280 episodes, just head on over to our wonderful website at thisoldmarketing.site. We want to thank the good folks at Radix for powering our This Old Marketing dot site. And folks, until we meet again, just remember, it's your story to tell. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on This Old Marketing.